Good afternoon. Um, first of all, here's the QR uh, code if uh, you're interested in the slides. And we're also going to be looking at some code, so that's available there. Or you can use the short URL there. Uh, all this information is going to be available if you want to review it now or afterwards, okay? So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Ariel Ortiz. This is a photo of me and some Dutch guy that I met at PyCon US a few years ago. I come from Mexico. Mexico is in another continent, so I'm pretty far away from home. But I'm uh, really delighted to be here at, uh, at Czechia. It's been awesome to, to learn about your culture and to know a little bit of, about the city. Uh, it's, it's been pretty, pretty good. Uh, I'm a full-time faculty member. I'm a professor at a university, Tech de Monterrey, it's called, uh, Monterrey Tech. Uh, we're a multi-campus private university, the, the most important one in, in Mexico. And this is one of my uh, my sections that I was teaching last semester. So uh, what, are, uh, what is it that I'm going to be presenting uh, during this talk? I'm going to give a brief introduction of what multiple inheritance uh, is. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the diamond problem, uh, how we solve the diamond problem using this thing called the method resolution order. We're going to talk about the super function uh, a little bit, we're going to mention briefly what mixins are, how we can use them. Uh, we're going to see some alternatives to multiple inheritance. And finally, we're going to have some conclusions here. So um, let's start talking about multiple inheritance by presenting an example. So let's say that we have uh, a user string. Uh, this class already exists. It's part of the uh, collections package in, in the Python standard library. It basically is a class which you can uh, derive from it, you can extend it, and uh, it gives you basically all the functionality that you need for a string, or something similar that works similar to uh, a primitive string. So let's say that you want to create your own class called string counter, and you inherit it from that one, okay? So um, we call this relationship an extension, or extends, also known as uh, is a, okay? The, this is a UML. Uh, diagram of classes. And let's say that we also wanted to give it some additional behavior, but this one uh, provided by another class called counter, which is basically like a dictionary, works very similar to a dictionary, uh, but it keeps the, the keys of the dictionary are the individual elements contained um, in, in the dictionary, uh, well, in, well, in your collection in general. And uh, the associated value to those keys are the number of items, or the number of times that certain items appear. So this is really known in other uh, languages as a multi-set. Okay, it's, it's a set that allows you to contain more than, than one element. Okay, so you want to have that functionality as well. So uh, in this case, it makes sense to actually use multiple inheritance here. So let's start looking at an example, uh, specifically how this would look with... Um, uh, as, as uh, Python code. So here we have um, the user string and the counter. Okay, we in, uh, indicate here uh, that we want to inherit from these two, these two classes. And we can provide additional functionality. Minimally, we would need here to provide at least uh, the way to initialize the, the two parts of our two different classes. So here we call the init, the dunder init method for the user string, and here we call the uh, dunder init method for the counter, okay? Uh, basically, because we're calling it explicitly using the name of the class, uh, we need to uh, uh, indicate that we're uh, using this or providing the, the, the reference to the self object that has, is being initialized at this point. So um, the way of using it is that we now are able to uh, instantiate here the string counter class. Uh, we provide in this case a string, okay? So my string count counter SC is a string, so you can basically use it with uh, string methods. So for example here, uh, you can see what the value is. Well, let's, let's run it here. So our string counter contains a string succeeded, okay? SC in index zero contains the, the character S. 
the length of our string counter is nine, okay? And we can call methods like upper, and it puts everything in uppercase, okay? But we can also use it as a, as a dictionary, okay? And we can say, well, give me the items of, of our string counter. The items are, as I mentioned before, uh, the elements, the, the keys would basically be uh, each individual element that is in the string, and the associated value is how many times it appears, okay? If we request here the, the, the keys, okay, we get ex exclusively the, the unique elements, okay? And most common basically gives you the same thing as items, but in, in ordered from uh, the greatest number to the sl uh, smallest one of, of occurrences of that, those particular items, okay? So fairly simple to use, very convenient. So um, let's uh, see the situation here. Let's imagine that we have a base class. And uh, we inherit from that base class another, uh, another class here called left and also another one called right. But then we decide to join them together again using <coughs> uh, a new class called derived. Okay, uh, Derived inherits or extends left and right, which at the same time, each individually inherit from base. So this is, looks like a diamond, and this is actually why it's called the diamond problem. Okay, Some people call it the, the diamond problem of death or something like that. Um, so um, there are different ways of actually uh, solving this, this situation, because the, the problem is, is if, for example, if I have a method over here, uh, and that method uh, is... Um, inherited both uh, from uh, both paths, okay, which one do I call? Or, or let's say that this method is uh, overridden from left and right, and I call it from here, which one do I go to? Do I go to this one here, or do I go to the original one? Okay, there, there are many possibilities there, okay? So first of all, let's, um, let's see how uh, C++ actually handles this problem. Anybody programs here in C++? Okay, quite a few. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry as well. Um, I, I have to teach, uh, as a professor, I have to teach a data structure course, and I'm not, I'm not entitled to actually choose the language, and I have to, do, uh, I have to use C++ in those courses. So um, I think the, the code of conduct says that we cannot mock other languages, so uh, I apologize for, for that. So uh, you work with C++, yay, it pays the bills, okay? Um, so let's have a look and, and see how this would look in C++ just for a comparison and see how Python uh, does it in a moment, okay? So here we have our base class. Um, it has something called uh, method, um, uh, a method called method, okay? It just prints method and base. Uh, and here we have to use something that is called virtual inheritance, okay? Which basically tells the compiler that if at some point uh, two different classes join into one using multiple inheritance, it only uh, uses uh, a copy of, of each of the methods and attributes that it has, okay? And at the end, for all this to work, here's a derived class. You need to indicate that it inherits from left and from right. But you need to specify, you need to redefine the method here and you tell it what, what to do. If you want to use the, the methods from the superclass, you need to call them explicitly here, okay? They are not called automatically. If you don't do it that way, the, the compiler will not allow you to, to have your, uh, your code work, okay? So um, this is how, how C++ works in this case. So in the case of, uh, of Python, how does Python ha handle the, the diamond problem? As I mentioned before, some other languages use some other kind of, uh, of schemes. Um, uh, you will find multiple inheritance in not many languages. Actually, the only two uh, mainstream languages that actually support multiple inheritance are Python and C++. Um, Perl also supports it, and it, it can, be, can be very arguable at this point if, if it's uh, still considered uh, mainstream, but well, you could say it is. But other languages like um, uh, like Dylan, for example, which is a dialect of Lisp, also support it. Uh, there's a language called Eiffel, which uh, was uh, probably popular in the 1990s, I think. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of it about it. Uh, I know that it was used a lot in, 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 in Europe, but I'm not really sure. Anybody has used uh, Eiffel? No? Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. So, um, 
uh, some languages sort of have some kind of multiple inheritance, uh, but with some limitations. So uh, Scala has things called uh, traits. Uh, if you program in Ruby, you have modules, and, and you can implement multiple modules or um, uh, import multiple models and so on. Okay, but uh, as as such multiple inheritance, it's it's really supported in in uh, very few languages. And the reason is very simple. This this situation of the diamond uh, problem uh, really can be a little bit uh, complicated. Um, uh, some languages handle things using uh, alternatives and use multiple uh, interfaces. So if you look at languages that have uh, recently appeared like Go language and like Rust and so on. Uh, they really limit uh, what you can do and they, they can hardly be even said that they don't even support some kind of uh, inheritance as we're used to. Um, but once again, uh, inheritance in, in practice has shown to be a little bit complicated. So that's, this is why uh, more modern languages have suddenly decided not to support it as much as languages uh, that are a few decades old. So. Um, in the case of Python specifically, the way that the diamond problem uh, is solved is something that we call the method resolution order, or MRO for short, okay? So the Python MRO, um, it uses an algorithm called the C3 super, uh, superclass linearization uh, algorithm, okay? This is the algorithm that we use here. And um, it was actually introduced in Python 2.3. Uh, that that one uh, that that uh, version of Python appeared somewhere in 2003, and all versions uh, of Python 2 onwards, and of course Python 3, actually support it. Okay, and it's used to determine the method resolution order of any any class. Okay, um, this algorithm is, is gonna make sure that uh, are all the the order in which we look for the methods when we have to execute a certain method. Uh, all subclasses should come before their base classes. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so if we were in a class hierarchy, I always start in the bottom going upwards. Okay, if we have multiple inheritance, okay, the base classes are kept in the same order as specified by the class declaration. So I can declare that I inherit from multiple classes. That same order is going to be uh, followed, okay, once we uh, look for, for the methods. And uh, finally, uh, it is guaranteed that we have a consistent and uh, predictable order, okay, across the uh, inheritance uh, hierarchy. So um, the algorithm, and this this is a little bit mathematical, but uh, let's see if we can explain it more or less quickly. Uh, if you have a class C that inherits from uh, these base classes B1, B2, and and so on, okay. Uh, the linearization algorithm uh, in, in a mathematical uh, formulation can be specified like this, okay? The linearization of an object, an object in this case refers to the class that is at the very, very top of the hierarchy. I'm not drawing it over here, but uh, it is implicitly there, okay? It's just a list containing that, that uh, base object, okay? This is the, the object that everyone descends from, okay? Starting from the new classes supported in Python 2.2, uh, a few, a couple of decades ago, um, uh, every class has to uh, derive from object or another class that derives directly or indirectly from object. Okay, and this is uh, the interesting part here. Okay, for any other class C, okay, the linearization of C, this C over here, being C a class that extends B1, B2, and Bn, okay, all the superclasses here. Okay, this is going to be a list, okay, composed of uh, a list of with a C, with the class C, and the result of calling this part uh, that we're going to refer as merge, where we're going to obtain the linearization of B1, the linearization of B2, and so on, until we have the linearization of Bn, okay, which are all the, the base classes, and then a list uh, comprised of B1, B2, and uh, Bn, okay? So uh, I know this mathematical notation can be a little bit intimidating, but let's have a look at an example so you can see how this works, okay? So um, when you're working with single inheritance, this works very, very easily. Um, so well, this would be the base case of our uh, algorithm. So the linearization of object is just a list of object, okay? So this is this part over here. The linearization of A, 
this one we just read upwards and following the arrows here in our, in our UML diagram. So the linearization of A, you start with a class A and then go upwards. So we start in A and then go to object. Then the linearization of B, you start here in, in, in B and go upwards. Once again, you only have a, a single inheritance uh, branch over here. The linearization of C, okay, starts here in C and then goes upwards to A and object. So that's what we have here. But the interesting part here happens with uh, whenever we have multiple inheritance. The linearization of D according to the algorithm I just described a moment ago, it starts with the, the current class, which is D, and then the merge of the linearization of its base classes, which are B and C. So it's the linearization of B, the linearization of C, and then uh, the classes B and C. Okay, the list with B and C. So here what happens, we replace the linearization of B, which we computed over here, it's BA object, the linearization of C, which is CA object, okay, which you have over here, and uh, the list BC is maintained the same. So what we do over here is that um, for every list that we have here, each list has something that we call a head, which is a very first element, okay? This is the head of the first list, the head of the second list, the head of the third list, and the tail is everything other than the, the head, okay? So this is the... The, the tail of, of this list. A, an object is the tail of this other list and the tail of this other list is, is C, okay? So what we look here, going from left to right, we look for the head and we check out and see if it doesn't happen, it doesn't occur as the tail of any of the other lists, okay? So here's B and in this case, B does not happen here in the tail of this one here and it doesn't happen here in the tail of this other list. So B, is would be the next element that we're gonna add here to the linearization. So we would put the B over here and we eliminate it from up here. So the B is eliminated from here. This one remains the same. And BC, we remove the B here and it just keeps a C. And we repeat this process here. In this case, we find the, uh, the head of, um, of this list to be A, but A is also uh, appearing here in the tail. So if it uh, happens here to be in the head and in the tail, we cannot uh, put it here at this moment yet, okay? We look for the next head going from left to right. So C is the head here. It's not part of, of, of the tail of any other of the lists. It does happen here, but it's, it's also the head. So we take the C and we put it down here, okay? And we eliminate the C where it happened. Uh, we eliminate the C that produces an empty list. So we take it away and now we have uh, the C over here, we just need to merge A object and A object over here, here. That's pretty trivial because A appears a, a in the head position in both places, so A would go to our resulting list here, and now we only have object, so at the end we end up with this D, B, C, A, and object, okay? So this is in general how it works. Once again, if, uh, if you found this a little bit uh, complicated to understand and you want to see how it works, uh, you can al always check the, the link that I provided in the previous slide, which explains the algorithm which, with much, much more detail and much more uh, exa examples than what I'm doing here, okay? So um, if we look, we quickly check. Um, oh, I, I skipped this example over here, but well, um, this was the same uh, diamond problem over here. Let me just show you what this one does. Remember, this was where we have the base uh, left, right, and derived. And in this case, we call method here. Uh, using the, the method resolution order, we're gonna see that in this case, it executes the one in the, in the left, okay? And that's because th this was declared first, okay? Even though derived doesn't have its own method called method, okay? Uh, that one's uh, inherited from here, and because of the way it's declared, that's the one that it actually gets uh, executed. Now, uh, in any moment, of course, the simplest way to determine the, um, the method resolution order of any class is using an attribute here called uh, dunder mro, okay? So this one will print us here the, the order, okay? So it shows that uh, for derived, the mro would be first, uh, going derived, then left, then right, and then the base, okay? So this explains why we, we actually get to see this, um, this method being uh, printing the corresponding result, okay? So now in this example over here, 
This is the one that we just saw a moment ago. So we obtain here dbca an object, okay? Uh, this is the same class that we have there, the same hierarchy. And if we run it, we got dbc and a an object, okay? This is exactly what we obtain over here, okay? Uh, the next example that we have here, actually, um, it solves very similarly, but we get to a point, uh, if you look here at the, at the diagram, it's basically the same as the previous example, except that I'm saying that d I want to inherit from a. Why would you want to do that? I'm not really sure, but uh, I mean, if you try to do something like this, okay, you introduce a, a situation which makes this uh, unsolvable, okay? Um, when you compute the, the merge of, uh, of this part of D, you enter into a situation, in, in this case, as you can see, where A appears in the head here and in the tail, so you can't uh, take A from there. And then the other one would be C, but C appears in the head and in the tail as well. So there's no possible uh, solution there, so this actually produces a, an inconsistency, okay? And you literally, literally get this error that says cannot create a consistent method resolution order for basis A and C, okay? And if you look at this example, that's exactly what, what happens here. Okay. Okay, so this is the, the error message. Cannot create a consistent method resolution, okay? So, I mean, the, the easiest way to see how, how the, the methods are looked for or searched for, okay, is just using this, and if you don't get any errors before, it means it's everything's okay, and you can always just verify wh what the exact order is gonna be, okay? So, let's talk about the super function. Uh, there is this function called super, okay? It's a built-in function that returns a proxy object that delegates method calls to a parent or to a sibling, okay? Th there is a common misconception that super always calls uh, a super class, not necessarily, okay? The, the name probably doesn't help a lot to imagine what really happens. It really calls the next, um, um, the, the, the method that is next in line according to the method resolution order, okay? So it could be a sibling class. It doesn't necessarily to be a parent class, okay? Um, there's a, this really uh, great um, blog post called Python Super Considered Super. Uh, you can check it out and see really many, many more details on how you can use sub super, okay? So let's see an example here. Imagine that you have something like this. You have uh, F that inherits from D and E, which at the same time inherit from B and C and so on, okay? So if we look here at our code, um, the, the method is doing something very simple. It's just adding the, the, the name of the class as a string and then calling the, the, the super.method to, to call whatever it is could be a super class, or it could be a sibling class, okay, according to the method resolution order, okay? And F, um, in, in its simplest way, just calls the, the super of its methods, okay? So if you if you run this, okay, the first thing that you see is the, the method resolution order. So for this particular class hierarchy, it goes, it visits first F, D, E, B, C, A, and object, lastly, and, um, well, uh, the, the string that is produced is basically the same name of the classes, okay, but just as a plain uh, string over here, okay? Now, just quickly, uh, if you check this, these are alternative ways of, of uh, producing this exactly the same result, okay? Um, you can call super like this, okay? Uh, you can specify, in this case, explicitly super takes uh, two parameters. The first one is the class uh, where you're gonna start looking for. Well, actually, the class, starting from there, you start in the next one in the method resolution order, okay? And you specify this object. Actually, this was the way that you had to do it in, in uh, versions previous to Python 2.6. You had to specify these two pieces of data always. And they were redundant because, I mean, F is the name of the class, so it was really, uh, a little bit uh, inconvenient to have to, to write it here, and if you change the name of the class, you have to remember to uh, change also the reference that you did over here, okay? So um, that could uh, get it pretty um, pretty cumbersome, okay? Uh, but it's still supported, and as you're gonna see later, later on, uh, you can put actually a different class if you want to, okay? Here we have um, F, and here we're calling explicitly D, D method, if you remember, um, D is the next class after F, the, the, the first one in the method resolution order, okay? And um, 
it, this basically means that it's, it's going to start looking from here. So at the end, it produces exactly the same result, OK? Now, the interesting th things here happen if you do something like this, OK? If you say f uh, plus a uh, method, I'm saying basically start calling the, the method not f immediately from it, its next uh, uh, ancestor or, or uh, sibling, but go directly to uh, starting here from, uh, from a, OK? So if we run this over here, OK, you can see that it only produces fa. The method resolution is the same, but I'm saying start in a different, in a different point, OK? So th that could also work in peculiar ways, OK? This one gives you exactly the same result. <coughs> now, one weird thing here is that you can define your own method resolution order, OK? Now, just a warning here, just because you can doesn't mean you should. OK, so let's have a look here. Uh, we have this um, class hierarchy. Okay, so um, basically this is something similar. Now we're just adding here a, a condition just to make sure that um, you don't call a method that doesn't exist. Okay, and let me just eliminate this part over here. Okay. Um, so this is a normal resolution, CVA and then object, okay? So it, it's totally sequential, CVA, because it's just using single inheritance. But if you add this, and this is uh, where it gets quite interesting here, I'm telling it that I want to use as a meta class my R uh, O, which uh, establishes here the a new resolution order, which goes from the current class to A to B and then to object, okay? If I run this, Okay, you can see that uh, the resolution order has changed. And basically what I, I specified here is that I want from C to go directly to A and then to B and then to object. So I changed the way that this could, could be achieved. Okay, once again, why would you want to do that? Um, it could be some use cases, but in general, do not try to do this, okay? Um, unless you really know what uh, you're, you're doing, okay? So uh, let's um, talk a little bit about, about mix-ins. Mix-ins are classes that provide some additional functionality. So um, here's a very simple example. You have a JSON mix, uh, mix-in that just does the, the dump operation over here. Um, you have a, a person, okay, and uh, an employee class that uses a JSON mix-in. And the person, we only add here one attribute, which is a position of, uh, of this uh, employee. And, uh, well, this is a, a very simple example. The, the, the class JSON mixins is very simple. It's not meant to be used by its own. We just added to add some additional functionality. And, well, here we're calling uh, an employee. This is that, uh, fo the, the guy, the name of the, the, the guy who was in the photograph a moment ago, this Dutch programmer here. And uh, you just need to call to JSON. You inherited that from the, from the mixin, okay? Well, <coughs> Pitfalls of multiple inheritance, you have the diamond problem, you can have naming conflicts, increased complexity, unexpected behavior, so there's pretty nasty things. So what um, alternatives do we have? We can here, um, we recommend here to favor composition of our inheritance uh, and apply the ISP, okay? Uh, so favoring composition, it is often more flexible and convenient to build classes by combining behaviors, okay? Um, so I'm actually providing here an example. We don't have time to see it because we're out of time now, but let me just explain briefly if you want to look at the code. Uh, I, I provided here the code for these two classes. One uses inheritance and the other one uses composition. In general, if you can, this one is considered superior, specifically because this one here uh, gives you a lot of functionality that not necessarily is uh, applicable to a stack. So uh, stacks, you typically use them to push and pop elements from there, but because I inherit from user list, I can use all the operations that are uh, uh, defined for a list also as part as, as a stack. So I can insert elements anywhere, for example, and, and of course, I would be violating the, the, um, uh, the definition of what a stack is. But if you use composition, you only provide the methods that you require, and you use uh, a user list object uh, through composition, um, and you only guarantee that it is used exactly as you want, okay? The s uh, interface aggregation principle says that you should use uh, only uh, or, or provide uh, 
very specific interfaces and your clients only implement those that make sense. So I, I provided a few examples here of using uh, protocols, okay, if you use Titans and so on, protocols is probably the best option that you have in, in modern Python. Okay, so you check the, the, the examples that we have there. And just to end up here, um, if you're using multiple inheritances, use it with caution. In preference, uh, you should provide or prefer to use single inter inheritance or even not inheritance at all, okay? You should probably prefer to use composition. Um, if you are defining, uh, you're designing a class that uses multiple inheritance, just provide a clear documentation and uh, favor always uh, smaller mix-ins, okay? So uh, basically we saw here what multiple inheritance was or is. Uh, the diamond problem, uh, we saw a little bit about the, the use of super, uh, the use of mix-ins, its drawbacks and alternatives uh, using composition and the ISP, the interface segregation um, principle. Okay, so I, I hope this uh, was uh, in interesting for you. Uh, from me, that's all. Thank you very much.